it's good to come together here with you guys today. And uh, good to be here. I haven't been up here for a little while. It feels like a long time. Uh, we had a couple of the mission speakers up here, and then uh, I was down uh, in the Chicago, Milwaukee area last week uh, doing a celebration of life service for one of our friends down there. And it was great to be down there with my old uh, church family and uh, perform a service uh, for a guy who knew Jesus Christ and now is at home with him. And it was a great few days to spend down there, but I'm happy to be back here in Lethbridge. And I was doing some thinking uh, this last week and uh, wondered how many of you guys uh, watched the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, okay? Uh, dudes, don't put up your hand, okay? <laughs> <laughs> don't admit this. It's a little bit like admitting you have a Pinterest account. You don't want to do that. A couple of years back, I had uh, some friends start to send me a barrage of texts mocking me for my Pinterest account and that I was signed up for nail art, eyelash extensions, and long hairstyles. And I was like, I, I don't know anything about this Pinterest that you speak of. And what had happened is my daughter had signed up on my computer and used my Google account, and so now all of a sudden my friends were getting notices that I was interested in long hairstyles. Like, does that make any sense? Do I want to paint my nails and nail art? No. And I'm not interested in eyelash extensions. I'm sure they're great. But, uh, so back to how many of you watched, how many of you ladies watched the royal wedding last year? All right, a few of you, good. It was a huge event, the event of 2018, really. The royals exchanged vows in front of 600 people at St. George's Chapel in Windsor. Uh, more than 18 million people watched this in the UK, and 30 million people watched it here in North America. About 3.4 million people were tweeting about it, and uh, all 53 countries of the Commonwealth were represented on Meghan's wedding dress. Uh, Megan arrived at the event in a Rolls-Royce Phantom 4. Only 16 of them have been made. And so this was uh, amazing. It, was, it cost over $43 million. And more than 100,000 people lined the streets hoping to uh, get a glimpse of the newlywed couple in a wedding carriage as they went down the street there. What a grand procession it was. And here we are on Palm Sunday, and we remember an impromptu procession 2,000 years ago. Today is the day that we remember people lining the streets, uh, cutting off palm branches and laying them down on the ground, throwing off their cloaks and laying them on the street before a guy riding on a donkey whose name was Jesus, giving him a king's reception. People at the time had heard the story of him raising Lazarus from the dead. And they were honoring him as they would honor a king. They wanted to see him and treat him like a king. But today we ask this question, who was this Jesus? And if you're not already there, turn with me to John chapter 1, and we'll look at this. If you were trying to write a biography of a famous person, you would probably try to sum up the life of that person in the first few paragraphs. And that's what John does here in the introduction of his book. In the first five verses, we see Jesus illuminated. Jesus shown for who he is. It says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the primary truth about Jesus is very clear here. Jesus is God himself. It doesn't get much more clear than this. And it's difficult to imagine a more wonderful introduction than this. Even those first three words there, in the beginning. Uh, does this remind you of any other verse in the Bible? Even if you're not that familiar with the Bible. Genesis 1.1, the very first verse, says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, this John is referencing back to that. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus is the Word. He was there in the beginning. Now, why does John use this term Word to describe Jesus? Well, there's probably a few reasons, but one is the Greek word logos, 
spoke to the Greek-speaking people at the time, and it connoted this principle of reason that governs the world and makes a thinking possible. It's possible that this is part of what John had in mind, but more likely he had in mind the Jewish connotation of word, which had at its core this divine wisdom. And wisdom was at God's side at creation when he formed the world. All right, Romans cha- or sorry, Proverbs chapter 8 talks about that. And the word is viewed here as God's living voice. And one of my seminary professors put it best when he said this, Jesus as the word means that he is the living revealer of God, the very voice of God in this world. That's why he's called the word. And verse 1 tells us exactly who Jesus was. He was pre-existent. In the beginning was the word. Before the world was created, Jesus was. It says, and the word was with God. He enjoyed a special relationship with God. And the word was God. Jesus is deity. Now this is amazing stuff. This is over the top stuff. Only the very God of God would create the world and bring life to it. This is the most amazing thing that John could ever write in expressing about Jesus. Jesus is the word, the eternal word, partaking of the very essence of God. Jesus is God. And verse 3 and 4 go in to tell us what he did. Through him all things were made that were made. Without him, nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Once again, it says Jesus was the creator. It states it positively, and it states it negatively for emphasis here. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Jesus is the creator. He's the instrument of creation. Everything we see in this world, everything we see in this universe is from Jesus. Now, John would have understood this at the time, but he wouldn't have had the same understanding of creation and the expanse of it as we do right now, would he have? We know that this creation is amazing. It's boundless. The universe is huge. We've made massive discoveries about this. In fact, we had our first picture this last week of a black hole. Incredible stuff. We know such things as there are more stars in our own galaxy than any human could ever count in their own lifetime. And that's just in our galaxy. We know there are more galaxies in our universe than there are stars in our own galaxy. Incredible stuff, mind-blowing stuff at the macro level. But if we were to bring it down to a more micro level, our own bodies, we know that within our own bodies, we have approximately 30 trillion cells. The building blocks of our body. Our bodies are amazingly complex and intricate. And for the most part, these things work together. But we are sure that at the micro level and the macro level, our universe is made perfectly and the creator is Jesus Christ himself. God made it all. This is beyond scientific understanding. Colossians 1 puts it this way here. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. This is amazing stuff, isn't it? Blows our mind. Wonderful, powerful. In the original creation, he gave physical life and physical light to all mankind. In verse 4, it says this, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
Now, there's a double meaning here. Not only does it talk about the physical realm, but it also talks about Jesus giving life and light to us in the spiritual realm as well. The word brings eternal life to all mankind, and he illumines us for eternity. 1 John 5 puts it this way, and we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with true God because we live in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and he is eternal life. God illumines every single person with the light of the gospel through Jesus Christ and through him we can have eternal life, physical life and spiritual life. And this is the heart of John's message. Jesus is undefinable. Jesus is unassailable. He's unmatchable. But he is completely believable, and we are called to put our faith in him. Who is this Jesus? Is the question we ask. Jesus is God's living voice to the world. He is the word. He is the logos. He is the living revelation of God himself. And God wants to communicate with us here. And this has to move us towards worship, doesn't it? This is a wonder-filled truth. But there's more. Jesus is being proclaimed as well. The first five verses tells us that Jesus is amazing. And the next few verses tell us here that God has sent an envoy to announce that Jesus, his representative... His very essence is coming into the world. And John the Baptist is the one who's coming to announce this. There was a man, it says in verse 6, sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Jesus is proclaimed. The envoy is set out. Jesus is coming. May he be proclaimed. Now, we as readers of the Bible should have been expecting this. True readers of the Bible would be expecting this because the Bible prophesied that a Messiah was coming. The prophecies are clear from the Old Testament that one greater than David was coming. There were other signs too. A star in the east. The virgin birth was also an announcement. The angels coming and announcing it to the lowly shepherds, the wise men from the east making the journey to give gifts to the king of the Jews. And now we have the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? And it's amazing that some don't recognize him. But it's clear that they don't. In verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The Creator comes into the world, and he gets rejected. The word recognize that we have here doesn't mean that people just didn't, you know, notice him. It's that they actually rejected him turned away from him. His own people turned away from him. The Jews, the ones who had been praying for centuries for him to come. And when he's finally sent in, they turn their back on him and they reject him. In John chapter 5, it puts it like this. I have come in my Father's name, Jesus says, and you do not accept me. You reject me. But not everyone rejects him. Some do recognize him. In verse 12, such an amazing verse, it says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Wow. What an awesome privilege this is. Those that receive the word, those that believe in his name, those that put their trust in him. The change is incredible. The transformation is incredible. 
You become a part of the family of God. Paul describes this as adoption into the family, but John uses a more radical term. It's a birth. In verse 13, we see this here. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. John 3 speaks about this. John talks to Nicodemus and says, you need to experience a rebirth. You need to be born again. And John 3, 36, Jesus says this, and anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. This is the gift from God. We get adopted into his family. We can't do this on our own. We can't do this by natural means. It has to be done by God himself. And it's not by anything that we've done. It's just a gift from God. Now, I mentioned that I was down at my, my former church down in Kenosha, Chicago, Milwaukee area there. And it brought back a memory to me while I was driving around in the parking lot of the church there. I remember after a Sunday evening service, I got my family uh, in the van that we had at the time, and I was backing out of a parking spot, and I was sort of distracted, and I wasn't looking around, I didn't look in my rearview mirror, when all of a sudden, crunch. Ugh. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> I, I, I remember the sound of that low impact collision, and I think I probably prayed out loud, please God, help it not to be as bad as it sounded. And I got out of my vehicle and I went around to the back and I looked at the bumper behind me and it wasn't pretty. In fact, it was a brand new Honda. And it was the brand new Honda of the chairman of the board of the church. <laughs> well, what's one to do? Well, I literally thought for a split second that I could drive off and just swear my family to secrecy. But I didn't do that because I knew they wouldn't be able to keep their mouths shut. So. I headed back into the church, and I went for a lap around the church looking for the chairman of the board, and I couldn't find him, and I came back out into the parking lot, and I heard somebody yelling, I can't believe they drove off. Who did this? <laughs> and so sheepishly, I approached uh, the situation there, and I told him that the youth pastor had actually just driven out of the parking lot. <laughs> No, I didn't. I, I admitted to him it was me, and I asked him, you know, could you forgive me for doing this here? And he calmed down right away, and he said, yeah, I, I forgive you, Jeff. He forgave me, but there was still a problem, wasn't there? There is still a broken bumper on his vehicle. And honestly, I didn't have the expertise to fix it, and I didn't have the capital to fix it either. And so what did he do? He did what I couldn't do. Now, he took his vehicle, he took it to the auto body shop, and he paid for it to be repaired. He did what I couldn't do. You and I are in a similar situation. We are broken by our sin, and something needs to be fixed. And we can't fix it on our own. We don't have the capital. We don't have the ability. We've broken a relationship with an eternal God. He can forgive us, but there's still a problem. That sin needs to be paid for. Punishment needs to come. And we can do it because we have a broken relationship with an eternal God. There needs to be an eternal payment for this. And that's why Jesus Christ had to come as the God-man. If he came only as a man, he could pay for himself, but not for us. But because he came as God as well, he could pay the eternal payment for all of us. That's why Jesus had to be the God-man. That's why Jesus is God in flesh, both divine and human. And because of his sacrifice on our behalf, because he took our place on the cross, we can have the benefit of being reborn into God's family. But as many as received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right 
to become children of God. Amen? This is so wonderful. This is so powerful. This is absolutely something that needed to be done for us. We couldn't do it on our own. Oswald Chamber puts it this way. When once you realize all that it costs God to forgive you, you will be held as in a vice, constrained by the love of God. Who was this Jesus? God's revelation to us. The one that came down and took our place on the cross, took the punishment for our sin upon himself, and he opened up the way for us to become reborn into God's family. This has to move us towards worship. This has to move us towards wonder. This has to put a smile on our face and love in our heart. And this must be expressed. But there's even more. I know I've hinted at this here, but verse 14 is one of the most incredible verses, one of the most deepest theological verses ever written. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus incarnated. This is a reiteration here. But the only basis for man entering into the realm and the family of God is for God to come into our realm, the realm of humanity, and provide redemption. And John states this unequivocally here. The Word became human. The message puts it this way. The Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. He moved into our situation and he has made his home among us. This is God entering into our world. This is the creator becoming the created. God in flesh. Colossians 2.9 says this, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Amazing stuff. Mind-blowing stuff. But since God's indwelling presence was in the Word, John adds that we have seen the glory of God. God's glory has walked on this earth, visible to all with eyes of faith. The glory of God is now visible in Jesus Christ. And the praise and the worship of the church are now simply a natural result of what we've seen and what we've understood. An affirmation and a recognition of who Jesus is. This is powerful stuff. When we feel the presence of God in our lives, we should shout glory. When we see Jesus Christ revealed in the words of the scriptures, we should shout hallelujah. When we experience the peace of Jesus in our lives, we should turn our hearts of praise toward our King. When we see the power of God moving in our midst, we should shout glory to God in the highest. When we walk through suffering and we know that we have hope for eternity, we should pour our hearts out in praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who has promised eternity to us. All our lives are to be worshipped. This is the highest calling for all of us here to worship Jesus Christ as God's son. I was reminded of this this past week. My friend Myron sent me an email that contained just a section of a book called Exiles by Michael Frost. Frost says that our true calling in life is to worship God, but many times... We in the church are blinded by the contemporary term of worship that we take literally to mean nothing more than our corporate singing of praise to God. Now, corporate singing to God is a good thing, but that's only just a small part of worship. Worship is to be our whole lives, our highest calling in life. Jesus Christ came to sacrifice for our sake, so that we could be adopted into God's family 
And the result of that is our whole life should be about worship, glorifying God, giving glory to him. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Offer everything that you've had. Offer everything that you do to the glory of God for his worship. The passage, chapter 12, goes on and identifies many ways that we can worship. Not to conform to the norms of society, this is worship. To humbly express your spiritual gift in practical ways, this is worship. To love others, to love one another, this is worship. To be spiritually zealous, hopeful, patient, and prayerful, this is worship. To be generous with our money, this is worship. To be hospitable, this is worship. To live in harmony and charity towards unbelievers, this is worship. To go and to be productive at work, this is worship. To be on mission for Jesus, this is worship. This is glorifying God. And we are called to glorify Him. And one of the last statements that Frost makes here points this or drives this point home very poignantly when he said, it's ironic, isn't it? That in many churches, people who won't speak to each other are joined together in hymn singing or contemporary worship, not knowing that their actions undermine the very words that they are singing. Our whole lives need to be consistent in worship because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. The word is the absolute embodiment of God's gracious love and it has to impact every area of our lives. Hebrews 1.3 says this, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he has cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. And what's the expectation of that? That we will worship him because of what he's done for us. We will worship him because how he has loved us so much. Because of the gracious gift that we have been given that we didn't deserve. We should willingly pour our hearts out in praise. Who is this Jesus? Jesus is God in human flesh, the ultimate revelation of God, the one who provides us for a way to be reborn into God's family. We should worship him. They did this 2,000 years ago. When Jesus was on a donkey, they worshiped him. They shouted, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. On that very first Palm Sunday. And you know what? They didn't know what we know now. They didn't know that this was the God-man that they were worshiping. They didn't know that he chose to empty himself and come to earth and to save us. They didn't know that he was going to demonstrate his love for us through his death on the cross. They didn't know that three days later he was going to come back to life and show his power and authority over sin and death. They didn't know that all they had to do was believe and put their trust in him and eternity would be theirs in the family of God. And yet they worshipped him. How much more should we worship him in all that we do. Amen. Well, we're going to spend some time doing that right now. We are going to worship. I'm going to have my friend Rose come up here and she is going to read a poem of worship to God. And I would encourage you to worship as she reads. And while she reads, there's going to be pictures that come up on the screen. Beautiful pictures of God's creation. 
And we can worship him in sight in this way as well. And then after Rose reads, we're going to get an opportunity to stand and sing our praise to God as a reminder that as we go from here, we need to worship our King. Amen. The only unborn, the creator and sustainer. The three in one ensconced in sweet community. Thought up this grand experiment of love. Brainstormed this big idea. Split the darkness, broke the silence. Spoke the cosmos and its creatures into being. We, the creatures, once deceived, threw off our father's rule to follow our own will. And all seemed lost. But the holy God, the spirit, filled up flesh in all his glory. The clockmaker took on the tick of time. The word graced the page by entering the human story and the origin of light, laid bare the truth and made the shadows flee away. The sculptor morphed into clay. The good news wrapped itself in swaddling clothes. The wounded healer took on all our sickly woes. The gentle sage told us, showed us how to live, and the world watched in wonder. As the God-man strode the land, for we did not recognize him, and we did not know the scent of our own breath. We did not know from whence we came. He came in love to walk the lonesome road and hang upon the crooked tree, to wash with his own blood the stain of sin, to sacrifice himself that in believing we may live with him eternally, to battle death and win, to claim us as his children once again, to reunite us and invite us in, to glorious communion with our maker, our risen savior, reigning now and forevermore. Hallelujah to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ is Lord. <laughs> 